Located on 225 acres in Garden City, Long Island, Nassau Community College, a member of the State University of New York System, has close to 20,000 students attend the school each year. The college mascot is Leo the Lion, and these are his stories of the school's absolute best and brightest who have graduated over the past 50 plus years. So let's catch up together as the Alumni Association of Nassau Community College proudly presents Lion Tales on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. Welcome to Lion Tales. My name is Dr. Linda Nadian and I am a director on the board of the Alumni Association at Nassau Community College and a proud Nassau Community College graduate. Together, let's celebrate the successes of our alumni and share stories that will inspire, uplift, and hopefully amuse you. Each week, I will introduce you to one of our alumni who will share their Nassau Community College experience and the secrets to their success after graduation. The Alumni Association is working very hard at this time to bring you all of our new highlights. And look for many new and exciting events on the Nassau Community College Alumni Association pages on Facebook, Instagram, and our webpage. If you have any positive news you would like to share about alumni happenings, we would love to hear from you on our website at ncc.edu slash alumni. Today, our distinguished guest, our alumni guest, is Christopher Field, a first grade special education teacher for the Uniondale Union Free School District. Christopher's college career began when he enrolled at Nassau Community College in the summer of 2002. Nassau Community College has served as the academic foundation for many of his family members, including his sister and his grandmother, who are both graduates or of our prestigious nursing program. Nassau Community College inspired Christopher to cultivate a career of service. Upon receiving his degree, he transferred to Sunil Westbury, where he was in the psychology program and received his Bachelor of Science degree. Welcome to Lion Tales, Christopher Field, class of 2004. Hi, thank you so much. I'm happy to be uh, home. That's great. So yeah. tell us about your decision to attend Nassau Community College. I didn't really have a choice, you know, being 18 years old. And uh, let's just say that school really wasn't my thing when I was a teenager. And uh, my parents basically said, you're not good with, with your hands. You're not really good with tools. <laughs> so you have no choice. You better go to college because it worked out well for, like we were saying, my grandmother, she graduated in 82 from wow. uh, the nursing program. Yeah. So um, I started, I enrolled at Nassau in the liberal arts program. Yeah, we've had many alum that have said that they weren't exactly sure what they would do and they weren't sure about courses that they would take and how it would feel to be in the college setting. But usually community college experience helps you so much with that. What were some of the favorite courses that you had? Do you remember some of those? Yeah, uh, one course that really stands out for me is the, um, I took uh, American Sign Language one and two with uh, Dr. Greenberg. Dr. Greenberg, I think so, yeah. yes. For me, like like I was saying, academics wasn't really my thing. So this was like kind of like a, the place where I really learned that, that I do deserve my place within the world of academia and that I can do it. So especially being in her class, it was like I'm in a classroom where she didn't even speak one word of English. Everything was in sign language. And yet I thrived and I excelled in that. So I was like, wow, if I could do this, then I should be able to achieve my goals in, in my other classes as well. And now that you're in a classroom setting with, with young students that have special needs, um, how has the American Sign Language been a part of that uh, instruction that you're providing? Well, for some of my students, a lot of them are, are nonverbal or they, they uh, struggle with uh, expressive or language and stuff and communicating verbally so I do use a lot of signs as far as like going to the bathroom or like sitting I'll use some of those American signs and I, I get them to uh, learn that and I it's just like a visual reinforcer for them so that they get to understand what I'm saying and what are some of the essential skills or life skills that helped you to become an effective special education teacher especially working with you know such young students at this time I mean granted I work with younger students but I, I think one of the, the definitely the biggest life lesson that I've learned here at Nassau was that um, it, it's basically like w whenever you have a dream, or a goal in life is that with hard work and grit, you can connect your passions with your intellect and you could achieve anything that you set your mind to. Yeah, I think that also being here for me, you know, as, as an alum as well, that at the beginning, you know, graduating from high school, and you're not really 100% sure what you really want to do, but you know that you do have these small talents within you. 
And then when I came here, I felt that those were brought out in me where maybe if I went somewhere else, it may not have happened. So I always credit Nassau Community College for sort of allowing me to be myself because I, I really wasn't sure exactly what would transpire. How do you think the field education, special education in general, has been impacted because of the pandemic? You know, now we're coming back into uh, a full year of school. There's a lot of, you know, discussion about s- children sliding backward and maybe not um, being a few months behind. What are you seeing in the classroom, you know, as of this beginning? I think that for the, the lay person or someone who's not in the world of academia, they would um, automatically when you hear about education, you automatically just academics is what comes to mind. But for my students, it's much more than that. It's about basic life skills or routines and following directions and things like that, which is encompassed throughout the whole school day. So a lot of the kids that we're getting in school now, all those basic life skills are being thriving within the school community kind of has slipped away a little bit. So just trying to uh, reinforce that, like following routines and and things of that nature. Um, And also like independence is another thing they're used to sitting on a ipad and mom and dad are hiding behind the ipad yeah like prompting them to give them the right answer because they in you uh, know their intentions are good because they want their child to be successful but at some point you got to take that control away so a lot of kids yeah. are struggling with that you know i know i was able to see a lot of the remote work that we were doing when we were home mm-hmm. that you know the students were logging on and the parents were, were part of that mm-hmm. and you know although it was such an unusual um, method of learning you know, there, there was something to be said about it, that they, they were learning something, but at the same time, we couldn't really totally assess the skills. And then bringing everyone back for the first time, I think people were just happy to have the human contact again, which, especially for little students coming in for the first time, I think that that was just, you know, exciting to see. What is your real approach now to teaching that special education first grader who's just learning how to read now? Did it change any of your instructional approaches as far as uh, them coming in for the first time or maybe they really have not been in school for whatever reason? My teaching philosophy heavily relies on my own experience growing up in school or going through the, the whole school thing and not lack, not having that self-confidence in myself to say that I can achieve it like it, or this isn't just for the quote-unquote smart kids. Like just telling the kids, even though we're doing an activity that that you might be struggling to understand or or accomplish, just get excited about that because that just it's your mind telling you that you're about to learn something new that you can do and really pull that uh, independence part of it out and that that grit part, you know, where mistakes are just another other opportunities to learn and grow, which is definitely something that I learned here at NASA, like kind of like, like this is kind of like. My time here at NASA was more of like an experimental phase, like you were saying. Yeah. Taking those different classes. Like when I first enrolled here, I wanted to be going to chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I took a couple, like halfway through the course, I'm like, maybe this isn't for me. I'm better with people. Yeah. Than chemicals I did. Here. I had um, the biology class and I loved the biology class with the multiple choice tests and questions, I was failing that completely. But when we went into the lab and I was dissecting the frog and uh, labeling all the organs, I seemed to do really well with that. And and that's because it was a hands-on activity. Yeah. But then when it came to the tests, I was just not, I just could not, I was not getting 90s, but I was getting 65. And I'd be happy with that. It's a 65, hooray. (laughs) But yeah, that's something that you have to find that within yourself because that's that's something that really needs to be worked on because... um, you do need the confidence to be learning, and especially when little little children are coming in. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're funny and they're not really sure, but they take things very literally, so they want to do well. And mm. you know, then that's again your job. Um, did having the degree in psychology assist you in creating that workable classroom? Do you think that that is a factor? Uh, it definitely did. I, I think just having a deeper sense of of how we think and and react and and the background knowledge for like uh, behaviors and and emotional intelligence and things like that definitely helps me create that classroom culture where I want all of my kids to feel safe and also just feel safe and motivated to learn, you know? So looking at those subtle nuances, it's not so much about what they're saying, but it's more about the behavior and looking at their facial expressions and trying to interpret that and 
figure out. You are listening to Lion Tales on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I am your host, Dr. Linda Nadian, and our guest today is Christopher Field, Nassau Community College class of 2002, who is now a special education teacher in the Uniondale Union Free School District. So we were speaking about how your psychology degree uh, you know, assisted you in making that workable environment. Uh, what are we seeing now when students are coming in um, as a whole some of their needs um, when we break it down and we speak a lot about social and emotional intelligence and what a student really needs. How, how are we able to kind of grasp that and then be responsible for a child's mindset and their social emotional well-being? And what does a teacher really do in the classroom to cultivate that? Well, I think for especially I, for my students, my students come from homes that, that they may not eat all the time or they, they may not have food readily available to them. So making sure that their basic needs are met. If my, ty- if my child is tired and they need to rest for a little while, I'd rather let them rest and come back and work. You know, so I think that it, like we were saying, like it's the, the old way was just focusing on academics. It's much more than that. It's like that whole child piece where you, you have to make sure that their basic needs are met and then get them motivated to learn. And, and like, but that's also part of my philosophy of feeling welcome and safe and, and stuff like that. And there are some students who mm-hmm. uh, it takes a moment for them to let that wall down and know that like, all right, this adult is safe and and I can I can be myself around them. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we we really need to, uh, you know, break it down. I think all teachers have that sort of there's a responsibility, a professional responsibility to always be as well planned as possible because we never know like what the next day will bring. And because of the pandemic and what the educational system has been through, we we really came to a conclusion that, wait a minute, if we don't have health and safety first, we really can't even do any type of instructional work because we're not safe, we're not healthy, the environment may not be conducive, you know, people were getting sick, uh, kids were coming in and maybe they weren't feeling 100%. And then there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, post-traumatic stress because, again, the children at home are seeing their parents stressed out and seeing their family members stressed out because they were um, dealing with working and and pandemic and trying not to become, you know, ill themselves with uh, COVID. Um, what are some of the, uh, I guess, the social media aspect that you hear about in terms of special education at this point? Um, what, you know, where does that road lead um, for, I guess, more innovation and, you know, more uh, of the uh, responsibility that we can, you know, make it more than, you know, a 1950s schoolhouse type of setting. I think that inclusiveness, uh, visibility, really focusing on trying to include uh, my students within uh, the whole class, the whole school community is uh, something that we really need to reflect on and focus on. Trying to find a curriculum that that's kind of uh, conducive to their needs and it's malleable based on what their skills are and where we can bring them to is another thing that I think that, uh, I mean, the school system really should focus on as well. Yeah, I think that there's so much that, that we can do now. I, I think we shouldn't be afraid to do that. Like just little simple things like maybe some more outdoor activities You know, not necessarily like a field trip, but even allowing them to just come out of the classroom and walk around the school grounds just on a daily basis to to kind of get the feel of being outside. Um, And, you know, a big emphasis has been now on equity and diversity and inclusion in within the school system, but also with children with special needs, like where exactly do they fit in? Because especially with the little ones, you, you'll you see, talk about like the progression that you might see when they come in at the beginning of the year and they're six. But at the end of the year, um, you know, we ha- we did have a student last year that you actually have now. And she really blossomed where we thought she may not ha- blossom. We thought that it would be her behaviors would interfere with her learning. And you could talk a little bit about how you saw that transition happen, that it worked. Yeah, well, definitely. Um, I, within the beginning of the year, especially with my student population, it's um, a strong emphasis is really getting them to develop those social skill that social social skill piece. You know, so like um, even with the pandemic, they were at home with their families all the time. They weren't out within the community practicing those 
valuable life skills within uh, interacting with people, having appropriate conversations, like uh, following routines and boundaries and, and things like that. So um, with this student, she definitely has grown since the beginning of the school year. Like she came in there and it was, uh, I have all these adults around me that are telling me I have to do this at this time and, and move through and follow the rules and, and do things that I don't want to do within a certain amount of time. Um, she's definitely, I, I think just even being within that classroom setting helped her develop those skills of kind of defining what school is and what the expectations of it were. So now that I have her this year, she's definitely coming in and, and she's actually the stickler for the routine where she'll mm-hmm. tell me like, Mr. Field, we have to do, it, it's 9.30, we're supposed to be doing this right now, yeah. it's reading time, you know, so it's it's good. You can see that when when she starts to tell me what should be done Mm -hmm. then you can see that you know (laughs) yeah and then i think you know establishing the routines because like we said the students are so literal about it they say wait a minute it's nine o'clock we we have to go to the library like they they really do hang on to that what advice would you give to the potential teachers that are coming into special education they want to get their degree now um you know knowing what you know now what you've learned at nassau and the courses that you did take here how would you maybe advise them about that path, you know, into the field of education? Um, I, I think that education is much more than, than what you're reading in a textbook. I, I, it's it's an action. It's a, it's a verb. It's unconditional love for uh, your students and for humanity, I guess you would say. Like you really – there are times where you're going to be making sacrifices and, and have to in, – in order to uh, – ensure that that your students are reaching their full potential you know and even it's not even so much about what's going on in the classroom it's ensuring that they're happy healthy and safe at home and being uh, almost like a sounding board or a source a resource for families who want to get more uh, resources and supports for the, for their child yeah and i think we spoke about this earlier too a little bit about early intervention and I've noticed a lot of commercials on TV where they're they're sort of focusing on some of the signs of autism, mm-hmm. and you know what a family what the family can do when they notice certain behaviors. Um, how would you sort of advise a parent then about the importance of early intervention? I, I think I, I mean for for us we know about neurological development and things like that, and, and within that, the earlier you intervene is the better off, the better results you'll see within the outcome be- because they're going through that whole like uh, neural bloom phase, I guess you would say, yeah. where if if a child is exhibiting a certain behavior, you provide the intervention right away and it'll diminish uh, quicker and more likely than if you wait until they're older. So just trying to explain to the parents that this is what I'm seeing. You might want to go talk to a professional and just kind of get some medical advice from your uh, yeah. family doctor. Yeah, and because, again, you know, teachers are not medical doctors, so we really can't diagnose. We can only uh, observe and then make an assessment. And mm-hmm. sometimes we do get caught up in that because I think a lot of families might think that the school districts and the teachers have the answer mm-hmm. medically, but a lot of times we really don't. We, we can only observe and kind of go on our uh, past experiences working with children that may have special needs mm. um, and when it comes to autism do you find that it's being you know students are being labeled immediately or it's basically sometimes it'll say multiple disabilities how do you feel about like a label on that you know IEP on the plan I mean f- for me honestly a, a label is just a means of getting the services that the child needs as as far as me providing interventions and things like that with my students I don't care what their label is I'm looking at their behaviors I'm looking at their academic levels I'm looking at what their needs are I really honestly a, a child with autism I I might give the same reading lesson uh as a child with autism or a child with speech and language disorder it doesn't matter um, it's just a way of trying to figure out, okay, this is what's going on with the student, but it doesn't define the child. Right. You know, and with neurodiversity, it doesn't matter what the label is. Right. So, you know, just trying to really focus in on what that child's needs are and then trying to create, tailor instruction based on that child and also giving those suggestions to the parents as well. You are listening to Lion Tales on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. 
I'm your host, Dr. Linda Nadian, and our guest today is Christopher Field, Nassau Community College Class of 2002, who is now a special education teacher in the Uniondale Union Free School District. So we were speaking about, um, again, social emotional, psychologists. Um, there, there's so many things that encompass that special education program. And um, I think that, you know, throughout, I guess, history, you know, going back, let's say, like 100 years when children's needs were not met the way that they are. And now we're, we have a heightened awareness. Like, how heightened is your awareness of really what a child needs and and do you find any frustration in sometimes we can't bring out the best in a student or we just don't have the resources what what might we you know do when we really feel that we need something else but we're not sure what it is i definitely get frustrated a lot because i i know that my number one job is is to see the potential in all of my students no matter what so like sometimes you feel that's my big albatross around my neck, I guess mm-hmm. you would say. Like yeah. like I know what I need to do in order to have that child thrive, but not having the resources or having sometimes parents w- will be reluctant, which I understand as a child. They're, they're trying to do the best that they can for their child. You know, so, so just trying to convince those people as best as you can to maybe like try it, just try it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, things of that nature, I guess. Um, what yeah. are some of the... Uh, I guess, strategies you use to kind of build the trust with the parents. You know, we we know that at the beginning of the year, we have meet the teacher night and they come in and they see you. But then throughout the course of, of the year, how do you kind of maintain the relationship? I, I, for me, it's definitely constant communication. I'm also not just calling my parents when uh, with something negative. I might just call them like, hey, I noticed this. And uh, the other day, the one student that we were talking about, yeah. she um, it's a big milestone for her, but she went and she helped one of her friends pack up and she said, no, she likes to eat this for snack. And she got that for her. So I called the parents and said, listen, you know, like she's like noticing this and, and she's helping other people. This is a big thing. Like, you know, yeah, it really they is were excited because they were like, oh, they, she doesn't do that for her sister at home. Like, no, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing. I mean, there are things you find, too, that there are things that your students will do with you in class that they don't do at home. And then the parents say, I never knew that they did that, that oh, they did that. The, yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah. And know. this little girl that, you know, we work with for a while, um, you know, I know when she first came into the gen ed kindergarten because she wasn't placed yet, mm-hmm. she it was more like a toddler coming in and so the behaviors were you know indicative of a toddler and she just really didn't know any other way then as time went on even her body physically changed because she looked like a little tiny baby Mm -hmm. and now she looks like a little girl and her body changed so much and obviously the brain and the body and that connection is Mm -hmm. is something that I always tell you know potential teachers to you know, think about the physiological changes and the psychological changes and everything that a child will go through, you know, in order to develop. And then with a special needs issue, it mm-hmm. compounds that because it may be delayed. So you might not see certain behaviors for, you know, three to six months where the gen ed kid is already reading and already surpassing that. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of reading and literacy for your, you know, young learners, what are some strategies that you might use for them to get them to be able to, uh, you know, move past emergent, you know? I, I think I definitely try to use a lot of multi-sensory techniques, like, like appealing to the different learning styles, you know, like hands-on, kinesthetic, or visual. You know, it's not just so much me sitting there saying, A says, ah, you know, having them explore their environment, trying to create authentic experiences where they're working on the concepts and skills that they're learning, but they're also like trying to get them to participate in these acti- activities as independent as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, so like I use a lot of technology, uh, I use a lot of songs to get that rote memorization yeah. part of it. Um, I'll use uh, shaving cream is a big thing with yeah. me. You know, getting them to write with the shaving cream that that kind of develops their their motor skills and, and yeah and you know well, way back when in the 40s was the grace fernald and everything was the yeah. vakt visual auditory kinesthetic tactile and 
although it the strategies are allegedly old, they they actually work now, and and all of that has been developed. So it really does allow the students to come to almost mastery, mm-hmm. even though you know you're doing it every day. But do you do you take notes on like their um, like do you watch them when they're in the small groups? Do you kind of keep like a mental note of of that level of progress? Yes, I'm always I'm always uh, I, everything I do is small group for the most part. I, I I do a couple whole group lessons, but the most of it is small group with like four maybe five students at a time. So I'm always collecting data. I'm always analyzing and and noticing. Oh, yesterday he didn't remember what this letter sound is, but today he's doing it, and right. now he's helping his friend remember it. So like that kind of when they start to oh I got it, that shows me that they have the confidence. Yeah, and they're also remembering. They're so confident that they remember that they're helping. Appear yeah. with it, and so. it's so exciting when there's like a breakthrough, and yeah. you think, "Oh my, they got it!" You know, <laughs> they got it. And you know, teaching reading is so complicated because again, it's all based on your prior knowledge and what you're bringing to the table. And you know, you might know more about frog and toad than the other child does, and so they're bringing something different to the table every time you read a book. Um, mm-hmm. And you know that the kids really love uh, really good literature and books because you're sharing that with them every day. So it's good to expose them to that. Definitely. We are going to talk a little bit about just NCC preparing you. So when you came to Nassau and now when you left the day of graduation, how, you know, how did that feel when you said, wait a minute, I wasn't sure at the beginning. Now I'm at the end. I'm, I'm coming out with my degree. What, would that, what did that feel like? I honestly, when I first started at NCC, I never thought that I would be someone who would hold a degree. Wow. But, like, you know, I didn't have that confidence in myself. Like we talk about our students. So I think that that's why it's so, I'm so passionate about it with my kids. So when I graduated, it was kind of euphoric in a sense, like, wow, I actually I have a college degree now. You know, if I got this now, I can go get my bachelor's. So I went and I got my bachelor's. You know, I always knew that I wanted to be in service, like working with people. My father was a homicide detective. My uh, grandmother was a nurse and was a uh, narcotics detective. And, And my sister, well, she became a nurse later on. So like we come from a family of people who help people i guess you would say in right. some way so i wanted to do something meaningful you know so and i was i've always been interested in people so i went to oh westbury got my degree in psychology after that that was like kind of when i knew I wanted to become a teacher like after I graduated from Old Westbury. And that whole notion, I think, of making service your signature is is mm-hmm. really something that people have ingrained in their soul and it somehow comes out and NASA seemed to move you toward that. Definitely. I would like to thank our guest, Christopher Field, NASA Community College Class of 2002, who is now a special education teacher in the Unidale Union Free School District. Um, how can our listeners contact you if they wanted to email you? They can email me at... Uh, so it's mr period field f i e l d eight four at gmail dot com. I would like to thank you for being our guest today. My name is Dr. Linda Nadian, and I serve as a director on the board of the Nassau Community College Alumni Association, and I am a proud Nassau Community College alum. Visit ncc.edu slash alumni for more information about the Nassau Community College Alumni Association. And visit nccradio.org for more information about Lion Tales, including podcasts of past shows. Thanks for listening to Lion Tales here on The Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.